Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, coming this evening. Uh, this is the first of our spring series. Uh, it seems more mic'd than usual. I feel strange. Um, but this is the first of our spring series for the International Security Speaker Series at the uh, Robert Strauss Center. And um, before I introduce tonight's exciting speaker, I have to uh, advertise a, a little bit. Um, I, we uh, do a whole series of these. We got five good talks coming this semester. You can find uh, information about all of them at uh, www.robertstraussecenter.org. Um, our uh, director, fearless director of the Strauss Center, Jim Lindsay, is in the back. He's our, our great sponsor. We love him. And um, uh, uh, in particular, we have um, next week, I'll advertise the second um, in our series, uh, Steve Schooner coming from the George Washington University Law School. Um, uh, his talk is called Not Your Father's Battlefield. Uh, it's about privatization and national security policy, and uh, so about private security contractors and, and other such issues. Um, it should be a very interesting talk. That's uh, Wednesday night, the 11th, here at 5 p.m. I hope to see you then. Um, uh, my other uh, very happy task is to thank our co-sponsor. This is the Robert Strauss Center, but also the LBJ Library. Betty Sue Flowers here is the director, and we're very grateful that um, we get this lovely room to look out at President Eisenhower in the LBJ Library. It makes us very happy. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we're uh, glad to be here. So um, for tonight, uh, we are very uh, pleased and privileged to have uh, Tom McNair from the RAND Corporation here to speak to us. Um, uh, Tom is uh, one of the real leading lights of policy-oriented analysis in um, national security. He's uh, um, uh, had a, a, a wonderful career studying a lot of really interesting uh, topics in national security policy. He was at, at the Brookings Institution for many years. Uh, he was at uh, uh, Harvard when he started in this business, and then uh, he got the you know kind of policy-oriented career, and then uh, he left Brookings. Um, geez, I don't know exactly when. Ten years ago or something. Twelve. Yeah. Twelve. Twelve. Nineteen. Yeah. Well, Nineteen ninety-five. Ninety-five uh, to go to the Rand Corporation and. Uh, um, done a number of things there. He was, for a time, the director of the Arroyo Center, which is the part of the RAND Corporation that works for the US Army. The RAND Corporation is this kind of funny uh, in-house think tank um, uh, for US national security establishment. And the part of it that works for the Army is, uh, this is a big and wonderful job. And uh, we're very grateful to have had Tom doing that. Um, for the years that he did. And now he is the, uh, one of his many research interests, he's interested <coughs> in, the, in the Army and acquisition and the Middle East, and he's written on a lot of things, but he's had a steady research interest in international relations and foreign policy of East Asia. He's a, a, an expert on, on this topic, has written a number of articles. Um, uh, uh, did you write a book on East Asia? No, it, uh, uh, I just couldn't quite finish that okay. one. Sorry, uh, I didn't, didn't want to prod at there's, the there's source There's years spot. left. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, you know, I, I love his book. I just wrote an article citing his book on US military in the Middle East, um, uh, many other things. But OK, so East Asia has written good articles about. And he's now the acting director of RAND's Asia Pacific Center. Um, so he's very engaged in kind of the current national security debates about East Asia. And he's going to talk to us tonight about um, you had a clever title, and I've lost a Korea between Japan and China, and how we're stabilizing Northeast Asia. All going to get safe. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So please, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, thanks for that introduction. That gentleman will speak next week. I'm just a, a normal, <laughs> run-of-the-mill person who will try to talk to you a little about. Uh, Damn it. Okay. So now we get uh, uh, LBJ as well. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Boy, sandwich between two presidents. Uh, Thanks for the invitation, the introduction, and also the weather. I really appreciate your, your uh, ordering up a, a perfect day. And so uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Ben, how are you? See some old friends. <laughs> I don't use old friends. I use long-term friends. It's just Ken, Ken Flam and I were colleagues at Brookings, actually managed to co-author a chapter many years ago, as I remember it. I want to talk about Korea uh, from a somewhat broader and I hope more strategic and more historical perspective than, than is normally the case when we talk about Korean security. You know, for, for, for most Americans, and I think this includes policymakers, uh, you know, the, 
Korea is sort of the Cold War confrontation that just won't go away, right? It's a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, we got, you know, if you go back and you look at how we got into Korea, it was almost mindless. Uh, it was at the end of World War II. The Soviets were flowing into the north. You know, our focus had been on defeating Japan, but then, well, maybe we ought to get into Korea too, so we go up from the south. A young lieutenant colonel named Dean Rusk drew the line at the 38th parallel, little knowing that he would die of old age many years later, and that line would still be there. Uh, a famous bird sanctuary now, because nobody but the birds can live there. Uh, so, it, you know, we really didn't have a strategy for this until June of 1950 when the North Koreans attacked. Our strategy in the late 40s was all Soviet Union nuclear weapons containment, but containment meant Europe, and suddenly in June of 1950, everything co shifts to Asia, and that's the theater of containment and confrontation, and everything hardens up, not just the Korean Peninsula, but the Taiwan confrontation. Uh, and also our support to the French in Vietnam. So, so there it remains as a conference. We, we end the war in 1953, uh, not with a peace treaty, but with the truth. And so for the next 40 years then, we have this confrontation uh, on the Korean Peninsula that is a, you know, kind of stable, but in a very murky and, and dicey way. Uh, the Cold War ends, but even before that, China and the Soviet Union have both begun to shift their attention toward South Korea, which is growing. So there's this, this expectation in Washington that surely North Korea is going to dry up and blow away, right? And you go back and you read the articles in 92, 3, 4. Uh, not, not the case. Uh, in fact, the old man dies. Uh, his son, who's a bit of, considered to be a bit of a flake, uh, takes over and, and manages to hold on to his, his power right through now. He, he is uh, bellicose. Uh, they've gone nuclear. Uh, uh, they still maintain somewhat rustier and less ready forces on the DMZ, poised to charge south. Uh, so they're still there. Meanwhile, of course, South Korea is this massive success story in the last 20 years, booming economy, uh, political democracy. Uh, we take some credit for, you know, that as a case study in, in how you, you build states, but I think the Koreans deserve most of the credit themselves. So for most Americans, you know, the problem is North Korea. Uh, if we could just solve that problem uh, and get some kind of unification on the Korean Peninsula, we could get our troops home. Uh, Korea as a whole could start to grow. Uh, and you know, there'd still be international politics in Northeast Asia, but the dicey part of it would be, be gone. I, uh, my worry is that this perspective on the Korean Peninsula overlooks the extent to which the problem is not the division of Korea, but the security of the Korean Peninsula as a whole. Historically, this has been a very vexing problem, almost as vexing as dealing with the North Koreans. And if you don't, if you don't see that and then roll that into your strategy over the longer term for the Korean Peninsula, you know, after having been arguably very successful on the peninsula since 1945, you can, you can lose it in the longer run. So what I want to do is, is first lay out the, uh, an argument that suggests that the Korean Peninsula is the geostrategic geo center of North, uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, it is the fulcrum around which everything else happens and has been for several hundred years. Uh, then I want to I look out to how, how you have to think about this, what the implications of that perspective for the longer term U.S. strategy. Having done that, then I'll come back to today and what that means for how we negotiate with Kim Jong-il or whomever. And finally, then, turn to what I call the ugly middle, which is how you get from the short term to the long term, uh, when and if that ever, that ever happens. Okay, so, so what do I mean by geostrategic center of Northeast Asia? Well, first of all, Korea is centrally located. You can see that from the map that's no longer there, but you all remember it. Uh, it is also the weakest country out there. Now, it doesn't mean it's weak. It's just the smallest country always has been. Uh, it, it, that's, that's an odd combination of things. It's not that Korea has historically ever threatened anybody. Uh, it's that everybody else sees the other big powers threatening them through Korea. The Japanese look at the peninsula as, as a land bridge to Japan, and there's some historical precedent for that. The Chinese have even more historical precedent for thinking that, that Korea is the land bridge for Japanese to come storming into the northern part of Japan, and not just, not just in the 30s, but going back to 1592, if you want an interesting history, the Hideyoshi invasion of Korea. Uh, as a result, and, and then the Koreans themselves like to refer to themselves as minnows amidst the sharks, and there's historical precedent for that too. Okay? What, what this has meant historically is that 
nobody really lets the Koreans be independent and pick their security alignment. They tend to get it dictated to them in one form or another of suzerainty. Most of it's Chinese and it's very gentle, but for periods like in 1592 to 1602 and then again from 1900 to the end of World War II, it's the Japanese and that's somewhat harsher. But, but nobody, uh, yeah, somewhat harsher, I noticed. <laughs> Japanese had a way of doing things back in the 40s. Interestingly, though, they didn't behave that way with Taiwan, and so Taiwan-Japanese relations are, are really quite positive to this day, something that vexes the Chinese endlessly. Meanwhile, the Koreans and the Japanese to this day just really don't much care for one another. If someone has an insight into why that's the case, we can discuss that, uh, uh, that later. Okay, now the split at the end of World War II and the continuing confrontation on the peninsula sort of masks that history. In, in a sense, it's the perfect solution to the problem of Korean security. One set of superpowers gets the north and the other gets the south, and as long as there's no war, you know, everybody's pretty happy with that. So it's an odd form of stability. But the problem is when you now start to think about Korean unification, again, up comes this issue of what's the security alignment of, of a unified Korea. Now, the Koreans would love to be independent. They expect to be independent. And actually, if you're watching their defense budget, they're buying weapons like they're going to be independent, right? They're buying a lot of things that have nothing to do with taking care of North Korea, but have to do with projecting power uh, around the, the, the region. And, and perhaps that would work, assuming a very commodious Northeast Asia, if and when this happens. But nothing's very commodious in Northeast Asia. In particular, the Korean-Japan relationship is always a little dicey. Uh, there's problems that could arise with the Chinese as well. And, and so I would argue that in the end, uh, save in the very best case, the, oh, the Koreans are going to need a security umbrella from somebody, or they're going to go nuclear which the North Koreans have already done and South Koreans tried to do back in the 70s before we sort of stomped on that effort and, and closed it out. Uh, and if they go nuclear, the Japanese go nuclear. And, and, and you know, uh, perhaps someone like John Mearsheimer can say that's a better and more stable world. I, I, that world worries me. Uh, I'd rather not get it unless I get it by default. I don't, I don't want to put that out as a policy goal. So then the question is, okay, who, who should provide a security umbrella? China could do that. It's right next door. Although there are Chinese-Korean differences uh, having to do with the border and so forth between China and, and the North, but, but more importantly, I think the Koreans themselves will not want to cozy up next to the Chinese. And I think if they did, what the danger is you get kind of a resonance in anti-Japanese feelings, and so you get a widening split between China and Korea on the one side and the U.S., Japan on the other. I would much rather the U.S. hung around to provide a security umbrella that is sufficiently strong to discourage the Koreans unified now from going nuclear, okay? Uh, but not so, so visible as to tweak the underlying anti-Americanism that's still very much uh, on the minds of some, some Koreans, a non-trivial uh, group of, of Koreans. So if you think about it this way, you know, what you want, you, whatever happens between now and the unica unification of Korea, you, you want to be looking to keep yourself engaged and working with the Korean government in a way that allows you to negotiate a security arrangement between the United States and, and Korea that does tamp down the incentives to proliferate, right? So I'm looking for a long-term U.S.-Korean relationship, and I'm gonna, I want to play whatever happens uh, between now and then uh, in, in, in the, with the goal of getting that. Okay, so Korea is a... a uh, the security of Korea is a, a concern to all of its neighbors. Korea is essentially a, a multilateral problem, uh, and, and you want to you keep that in mind, but you want to also try to keep the U.S. engaged in that over the long term. What does that mean for today? Well, it, it means that you can't avoid seeing Korea as a multilateral problem. Now, that sounds pretty simple, but if you think about it, uh, even in the Korean administration, where you had a lot of engagement in Northeast Asia, once we got started, once Bob Gallucci was the negotiator, got started negotiating what became the Framework Accords, it was mostly a U.S.-North Korean deal in which even the South Koreans were upset by being cut out of the loop. The Japanese were completely out of the loop. The Chinese, you know, uh, it should have been a more multilateral negotiation than it was, although it, it ended reasonably well. And you have to remember, you know, that, that even uh, our Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, went to North Korea late in the Clinton administration, and there was talk that 
that, career, that Clinton himself would go. So, so things ended well with Clinton. The Bush administration, Bush too, is really an example of, of what I think is the failure of unilateralism. Bush came into office, and in particular with regard to Korea, the initials ABC, anything but Clinton, you've all heard that, I suppose. That was a fairly a standard expression. Uh, scuttled the framework accord. Uh, they put uh, North Korea on the axis of evil list. Now remember, this is 2002, right? We'd already bumped off the Taliban. Uh, we were starting to gear up for an invasion of Iraq. If you were North Korean or Chinese or South Korean, you could imagine that being on the axis of evil list meant you're next. You know, I mean, this was a military threat. Uh, scared the dickens out of the Chinese and the South Koreans, right? They don't want a war on the Korean Peninsula. It creates refugees. It, it just destabilizes their economic growth. Uh, and so what Bush discovered was he has no instruments to actually behave unilaterally here. You know, everything we do is mediated through South Korea and China. They didn't want it. We did. <clears throat> and so it went nowhere. The good news was that so frightened were the Chinese that in the, in the, fall, in the winter of 2002 to 3, just in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq, uh, Colin Powell was able to go to Beijing. And, and I, I've talked to the person who went with him, a former, former student of mine, actually, uh, who, who said, you know, Powell said, look, either you get more engaged in dealing, in pressuring Korea from your side so that I can go back to the American people and tell them the Chinese are engaged here, or I'm going to become irrelevant and the next guy through the door is going to be Don Rumsfeld. Now, that, that was back when using Don Rumsfeld's name really scared people. It, it still sort of scares me, but for a different reason. Anyway, so, so Powell actually used this in a kind of a curious jujitsu to create the six power talks, which, were, which the Chinese then put into place by the summer of, of 2003. Now, the Chinese goal here was always to get the U.S. and North Korea back to the table. Right? And the U.S. goal was always to get the Chinese to pressure the North Koreans because we have this belief that if the Chinese just cut off North Korea's oil, everything would be fine. Uh, we, we each got a little of what we wanted. Uh, we, you can point to evidence of where the Chinese have pressured the North Koreans. The North Koreans have to be really egregious. They have to set off a nuclear device, something you know, mildly provocative to get the Chinese engaged. But they have done that, and the Chinese have been cooperative. Meanwhile, the U.S. And, and North Korea are back to talking to one another. So in a sense, we're back to where Clinton was in 1994. But in that period between 2003 and 2006, when we weren't talking to the North Koreans, the world got a lot worse, right? The North Koreans tested several new longer-range missiles. They always fire those over Japan, you know, just to make the point to Tokyo. And then they tested a, a nuclear device as well. So now, you know, we're back where we were except that it's a, a worse uh, situation. In my view, a unilateral hard line, in other words, is counterproductive. Now, that's a debatable point, but that's what I would, would argue. And we're now back to recognizing within the six power talks the full multilateral nature of the Korea, uh, Korea problem. So, okay, we're talking to North Korea. What's the goal of this negotiation? I would argue there isn't one. Now, what the South Koreans and the Chinese would really like is for North Korea to see the light, accept the Chinese model of economic development, and, and begin to develop uh, on the assumption that a, that a developed North Korea would be friendly and easy to deal with and would negotiate away its independence in, a, in some kind of confederation with the South, which is a stretch even if it were to happen. In fact, I don't see much evidence that Kim Jong-il is interested in economic development. As you probably know, his people are still starving. Uh, estimates place the starvation in the late 90s at 2 million. There's an estimate that over this coming year, because of the weather and so forth, another million will die. This is a country that, that, that is terrified of economic development, won't do it, and is willing to let its people, people die. It has only one export, fear, and it has mastered the export of fear. It's, it's exporting fear right now, right, with its bellicose rhetoric toward the South, uh, which, which it's hard to take seriously, but it, it's sort of North Korea saying, the story is still about me, Obama. You know, can you get your eyes out here on Northeast Asia because uh, the new president has other things on his mind? Uh, in my view, North Korea is seriously paranoid. That means it needs an enormous amount of reassurance if it's actually going to come out of the shell. The United States is deeply suspicious. It's not likely to extend anywhere near that much reassurance. So what you have is a talk that just kicks the can down the road. It buys time. It's better than not talking. And I, and I seriously think that's sort of what we're doing. We're waiting for the break. What's the break? Well, 
you know, uh, maybe you have a regime change or maybe Kim Jong-il wakes up and, and sees the light, but, but more likely you have a change of regime. And that brings me to what I call uh, the ugly middle. In other words, we're, we're here, we're talking, we're not going anyplace, but they aren't blowing up nuclear weapons these days. So that's, you know, that, that when you're dealing with North Korea, that I guess is progress. Uh, but how do we get to this question of, 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 uh, of Korean unification? And, and the scenario I'd like to explore, I, you know, the, the one that says North Korea will develop and then we'll have a negotiation and North and South will confederate is, is not a military scenario. It's an economic scenario. It takes a stretch of the imagination, but, but it's an interesting scenario. But the one that interests me is the more military one, and that is the collapse scenario. Uh, how does it happen? Well, I, I do think that Kim Jong-il probably has to die one way or the other, and we know he's been sick lately. Uh, he has not groomed a son the way his father groomed him. There, there are a couple of sons or three sons that are all discredited for one reason or another. He has a brother-in-law who's actually more powerful, but the brother-in-law doesn't really carry the family line. And so in place of a named successor, you have the party, the family, and the army. And, and that's a, uh, you, can, you can imagine all sorts of ways in which that gets into a fight in which the focus of action is now on Pyongyang and the country, control in the countryside begins to erode. Okay. At that point, you have a humanitarian emergency in the countryside. Now, the Chinese over the last two years, some of you may be reading this more closely than I am, but they have made clear through their think tanks in Beijing that in the event of a massive refugee exodus from North Korea across the Yalu, they, they will probably feel compelled to come across the border into North Korea to stabilize that population on the south side of the Yalu. Uh, imagine Seoul. Uh, if the Chinese come across the North Korean border, uh, you know, suddenly, the, the, you know, the South Koreans in the United States feel compelled to, to move north. And so now you, you really have kind of uh, at the same time, uh, uh, you have at least a humanitarian relief and stabilization operation in North Korea. And, uh, you, you know, you got to ask, well, where's the North Korean army in all of this and all those special forces that they've had around for the last 50 years? Uh, so you could have a, a nasty kind of a security environment that looks a little like South Lebanon or, you know, it's, it's a counterinsurgency. Uh, plus, over top of this is sort of a physical negotiation between China, South Korea, and the United States about, you know, how far are you coming south? How are we going to get you out of here? What are your goals? And all of that. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody is planning for this yet. We still, I think, if you go out to CFC, the Combined Forces Command in, in, uh, in, in Seoul, uh, you know, we're still sort of thinking about a, a North Korean attack south where we have to defend. We're not postured for it. The kind of forces you would need to defend South Korea from an armored attack from, nor from the north as against the kind of forces you would need to stabilize North Korea and possibly deal with a counterinsurgency are, are very different as we've seen in Iraq. Uh, now, you can say, well, look, the South Koreans are going to do this. We'll get out of there. But have you looked at the South Korean army lately? You know, it's about 500,000 people on the active side. That's about the size of the U.S. Army. Uh, and so it's not really large enough to do this. Uh, moreover, their plans are to get smaller in the years ahead. They're transforming, which is a word that I am never, ever going to use, except in a lecture about transfer because we've so distorted that word. They're transforming using high technology to shrink their active force to 200,000 precisely the wrong direction as far as I'm concerned. So there's a whole lot of questions that start to emerge when you think about this particular, uh, this particular scenario. Uh, okay, what, uh, oh, one, one other thing, the Chinese in the last two or three years have opened the question of where the border lies between China and, the United uh, and, and North Korea. It's called the Northeast Asia Project. And it's, it's not official in the sense of the government. It's a set of university scholars funded by the state, but then most are. Uh, you know, uh, and it infuriates the South Koreans. You know? I mean, they got enough problems without having to deal with the Chinese sort of starting to relocate that border south. This is based on, on uh, the argument of ancient habitation. You know, and if you've been around for 3,000 years sort of going like this, you, you can claim all sorts of places, right? Of course, so can the Koreans. You know, you go back about 2,000 years, they're all over Manchuria too. So in, in short, this, this negotiation could be very, very dicey and very nasty if, if the Chinese choose to open that question. For, for the life of me, I don't know why 
they would raise that issue. They have a fabulous relationship with South Korea. They have had for a long time. Why they would raise this issue, which is, I mean, if you go to Seoul and talk to policymakers, they're ex extremely angry uh, about this, and, and un understandably so. Okay, so what does all this mean for our policy toward Korea uh, going forward? First of all, continue to talk to North Korea. Uh, uh, not that that sounds revolutionary, but we did try to stop that in the early part of the decade. I think not talking is slightly worse than, than talking. But never forget that while everybody wants the United States and North Korea in a, ba uh, in a bilateral dialogue, uh, you have to keep the other four powers engaged here. And that's a, that's a very delicate kind of a diplomatic maneuver because the, the North Koreans are always going to be angling to get you out of that, to get you talking to them bilaterally and ignoring everyone else. Uh, so you, you know, it takes an extraordinary uh, uh, diplomat. Uh, second, I think we really need to seriously reconsider our military planning scenarios here and also the structure of our forces. Uh, this, this is a big step, and I realize it, it's controversial. Some of you may want argue that we should just get the heck out of Korea, uh, and, and you know I'll, I'll allow that argument. I think, I think given where we, I think we want to end up at, with a security relationship with the unified Korea, I don't think that's a good idea. Now, uh, in in the six party talks, which continue to meet, uh, there are really two three party, two different three-party talks that are crucial here. The one that we watch the most is China, North Korea, the United States. That's the one we've been working on since 2003. But the other one that is growing more important as China talks about crossing the border, as China talks about where that border should properly lie, is the U.S., South Korea, China. And this is one where the South Koreans are not terribly cooperative. They, they don't want to get into a, a, a three-way with the two big elephants in the room where their security is sort of negotiated away uh, without them being able to control it. That, that, again, is going to take some extraordinary diplomacy. But if we can't get the South Koreans to agree to that kind of a – I think if we can get the South Koreans, the Chinese, and the United States talking about some of these long-range things, it, it can help to pave the way to a smoother – uh, negotiation. Finally, the, you have two, three, three-party talks. What about Japan and Russia? Uh, as, as some of you may know, Japan is so incensed about the question of North Korea's abduction of Japanese uh, that they just absent themselves from the, 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 the six-party talks. They won't talk to North Korea. You've got to keep them in the loop and you've got to continue to reassure them. This is an extremely difficult time for the Japanese. And some of it has to do with, with, with North Korea, which after all just set off a nuclear weapon and fired missiles over Japan. Where do you think the target is here? If you're Japanese, you can be forgiven for thinking you're in a real nuclear world, whatever anybody else is. And then you have four senior American retired diplomats, Kissinger, Schultz, Bill Perry, uh, and Sam Nunn writing op-eds that say, you know, the United States really ought to get rid of its nuclear weapons. You know, it's funny, the Japanese, wait a minute, what about extended deterrence? You know, it's an argument we used to have with the Europeans, now the Japanese are starting to raise it. And I'll tell you, you want Japan to go nuclear, you know, I, and Henry Kissinger's smarter than that, you know. Uh, what he's saying is we've got to work this with the Japanese, but, but a lot of other people may not see it that way. Uh, if there is a role for American nuclear weapons, it is in reassuring Japan unless and until you can bring down everybody's nuclear weapons in the district. So you've got to keep the Japanese involved, even though public opinion has taken them out uh, of the six power talks. And finally, just plan to stick around with when this is all over. We may have gotten into South Korea kind of mindlessly in 1945. But we should be there to stay because our ability to give them a security umbrella, I think, can help stabilize uh, Northeast Asia in the years ahead. Questions? Great. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. You uh, uh, actually stayed this, on this schedule. This table is designed uh, in yeah. an interesting way. It, it <laughs> clicks every time you yeah. think on it. Um, but so, I mean, is this a trick, kind of a joke? To yeah, right, to, to, to yeah. get you clicking things. But uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, concise remarks. No one stays on time. And I guess you leave it to the Army guy. Um, but uh, um, uh, I'm sure uh, Alan has the first question. Great. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Yeah, we remain friends. I've known about this problem for years. But my question is, you know, you know, there's an obvious analogy here to nuclear war with the Battle of the Gulf of Oman. We have a number of reasons why Korea would be given a role. Most of these reasons are actually, you know, acknowledged. They're, they're 
a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, on, on the good side, actually, you know, the South Koreans studied the German unification issue quite a bit, decided this is far too expensive, we can't do it, and that's one of the reasons they, they really don't want unification until North Korea develops. Uh, on the other hand, my colleague Charlie Wolf at, at Rand, uh, who, who has a, been around a long time and write, written some pretty good stuff, you know, would, would say, look, the analogy there breaks down. Germ German, East Germany was a, a, a developed society with, with a, a, a labor force that was used to a lot of state social net and support, right? I mean, it's a communist society. The North Koreans just wonder if they're going to live through the week. You know, this is a physically stunted, to some extent, poor and deprived population. So Charlie would argue that uh, th this is a kind of a poor labor force that's just waiting to be absorbed into South Korean industry. It won't be nearly as expensive. So in that sense, in the economic sense, the South Koreans may be vastly worse casing what is not that big a problem. On the other hand, I, I don't think there's any analogy between East Germany uh, as, a, as a military political entity and North Korea with its, its 50 years of just vitriolic bellicosity, its nuclear program, its, its uh, worship of the personality of, of uh, Kim Il-sung and his son. I, I mean, uh, you just have to expect an enormous amount of violence in the, in the, the, the uh, uh, unification of or, or bringing North Korea in if it collapses that you didn't have to expect in the case of, of, of East Germany. Uh, and finally, yeah, Germany has border disputes with neighbors. I don't know that it had any neighbors who were saying what the Chinese are saying about North Korea, that, you know, we're going to come in there if there's a humanitarian crisis and, and we may just relocate the border while we're at it, which really does add a, a dimension of a higher level kind of uh, uh, diciness that I don't think uh, Cole had to face in Germany. Okay, that, that would be... I think I, I have to take the bait a little bit. I'm sorry about this, but uh, since Alan mentioned all my grimacing, um, um, uh, get you to talk a little bit about um, why the United States um, needs to be in yeah. Korea. This was a big pitch of your talk. And so mm -hmm. um, I guess I would pose uh, two questions, quick questions about that. The first <laughs> is um, I'm not sure that um, Korea is as scary you know, in terms of the world ending if we're not there, in terms of there even being a war from the, from the Koreans' perspective. Um, Korea as the, you know, South Korea, let's leave the North out of this, um, uh, uh, by itself is the 10th biggest economy, is a high-tech economy, um, has a pretty effective, in terms of military effectiveness per dollar, military, has capability to, to augment this. And the geography is actually vastly more defensible than, um, uh, the geography of East Germany, for that matter, you know, the, the German-Polish border. It's um, uh, if somebody wanted to conquer Korea, um, it seems like Korea can make a credible claim without nuclear weapons to defend itself. And so, um, you know, the game being worth the candle, you have to convince me that deterrence is likely to fail, given that Korea is... A, a, a pretty tough porcupine if somebody wants to take it. And, you know, if Japan does, they've got, uh, Korea's got a moat, right? I mean, there's no moat around Poland or anything like that, but if Japan wants to invade Korea, they got to cross the water, which is very difficult. So it just seems like Korea is defensible. And then the second thing is, I, I don't want to sound cold and hard, but I sort of am this way. Yeah. Um, uh, but you will. <laughs> um, but I will. Um, uh, I hope terrible things don't happen there, humanitarian problems, I'll give them food, aid, you know, whatever, but um, uh, they want to have a war in Korea? What's the problem for the United States? Like, why does the United States need to join? Like, if they're going to have a war in Korea, why is that the United States war to join? Every time somebody's dying somewhere, we don't have to rush to the sound of the guns and have Americans die too. Um, like, what's our stake in this? Like, it might be good for the Koreans, but why is it good for the United States? Okay, let me start with this moat idea. Yeah, usually, usually peninsulas are kind of hard to invade except from the top, and, and uh, so the Chinese are an exception to that. But, you know, historically what's remarkable is how many times Korea gets invaded by the Japanese, right, or the Americans. We counter-invaded in 1950 and moved north. So, so the moat doesn't seem to, to, uh, uh, to be all that uh, effective. Uh, but, but more importantly, this is the nuclear age, and I do think that, that 
uh, if ever there were a candidate for proliferation, it's the Korean Peninsula, both given its history and given the fact that it's surrounded by nuclear powers, including Japan. I mean, uh, Japan's not nuclear, but every year and a half, some official suggests to the press that, you know, we can do this in six months, and then they resign and go earn money in the industry. You know, it's, it's all part of a signaling game that goes on, just to remind people that we're, we're not nuclear because we're such nice guys, but don't count on us forever. So I, I just, uh, and, and I think the real problem on that score is not so much Korea, it's Japan. Uh, the, the animosities toward Japan, the history issue, all of that, uh, I, I think, I don't know what, the Chinese reaction to a nuclear Japan is, but I, I'd really rather not find out. You know, I'd really rather head that off I if I if I could. And I think it's almost certain that if South Korea, if, if a unified Korea went nuclear, okay. So so uh, China could provide a nuclear umbrella, uh, and you know I think there's uh, there is an argument for that. Uh, again, the, the the issue is is more Japan or as much Japan as Korea. We are we are the one country that is actually able to mediate between Japan and, and South Korea, and, and we do it reasonably well. Uh, if you take that away, what you get is, is a standoff, the U.S. and Japan and Korea and China. That's a, not necessarily the case, but I think that's the way it would probably go. I, I, uh, I guess this is Mearsheimer's offshore balancer, I, I, but I'm not a fan of that. I, I'd, I'd like, I think we can do a better job of stabilizing Northeast Asia if we're there to provide a certain amount of assurance to, to South Korea as well. Now, uh, you, you know, your last point was just incredibly heartless and cruel, but, but I'll nonetheless address it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, this isn't just – First of all, I'm not saying war. I'm saying there's a humanitarian relief, relief operation which could be marked by, you know, where does the North Korean army go? This is a very nasty group of people. They're not quite as hungry as everybody else, so they might be willing to fight. And you've got these, you know, you've got a military problem there. It's not, not so much a war. It's, a, it's kind of a consolidation of South Korea's authority in the north. But to, to say that this is just any war, when we've been on this peninsula since 19. 45. We like to claim that this is the most uh, uh, glorious example of American state building, ignoring the fact that this is Koreans that did most of it. You know, for us to just walk away from that, I think is is there's an ethical problem there, but I also think it creates a precedent that I wouldn't want to I want I wouldn't want to export. So so uh, I, I hear your argument, and and I. Uh, Look, look, I'll tell you that if, if we're going to what – what I worry about is that, that uh, the view doesn't – I mean, you and I are making counter-strategic arguments. What I worry about is we are just going to wind up walking away from Korea because nobody thought through the strategy, right? Well, North Korea is gone. Let's, let's get out of here. Uh, and, and so I'd rather have the strategic debate, which is what I'm trying to, to, right. to, to get going here, uh, than not. And, and I, I – you know, I – I, I, I wouldn't argue your argument, but I'm glad we're arguing at that level. Yeah, Patty. Yeah. Oh, thanks. This is always before a really tough question, right? Gene <laughs> oh. didn't do that already. Yeah. <laughs> Could we have something else? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I see scenarios of violent um, explosions, of particularly massive trips. Is, what about that idea? What is the best thing you see um, of that? Yeah, it's been a while since I've read Bruce Cummings. You know, I, I, uh, I'm inclined to be in a totally different camp, which is that what the North Koreans really want is for us to be their ally, too, right? I mean, they, they lost their super uh, – any small power in that situation would like to have two superpowers to play off against one another, right? And they, they had China and the Soviet Union until the mid-'80s when China really – 
duplicitly shifted sides on them, and even Gorbachev started to do that in the late 80s. So they've lost their ability to, to sort of maneuver. They don't have any political space, and what they'd really like is for us to be their ally as well as the South Korean allies. So rather than us leaving the peninsula, I just think they'd like us to sort of even be more even-handed than we, we've been. I, I, you know, on the... Uh, I, I guess I, I really, and I have enormous respect for, for Bruce Cummings, who, who knows an awful lot about Korea, for sure. I, I just, uh, I tend to think that the anti-Americanism is, is uh, just the way they use, you know, it's rhetoric they use to sustain a regime that doesn't deliver anything else to its people. I mean, this is a pathetic excuse for a state, if you'll forgive me. I mean, a state that can't even feed its own people. To the, to the tune of millions uh, is. So I, I just think that at this point the rhetoric is, is ingrown and I don't, I don't particularly think Bruce is right on that. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, let's go back a little bit. I, I tend to think that the reason we had such a, uh, to some extent, an anti-American president in South Korea after 2001 was, was the axis of evil speech, actually, and, and the Bush policy. I mean, uh, that was going to be a close election in any event, but you had the Bush policy in the broad sense, and then you had that accident with the, with the armored personnel carrier that killed the two young girls just before the election, and, and that, that turned it. So I... I, I think that one of the reasons Lee myung Bok is a contrast to his predecessor is because of American policy. Uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I think North Korea, when it, when it waxes uh, angry at South Korea, uh, is really just trying to get the United States' attention. I don't take it too seriously anymore. I don't think this is a country that's – it's in a position, obviously, to rain down destruction on South Korea. It doesn't have to invade. It just fires artillery and then, you know, it doesn't even have to use nuclear weapons. This has always been the weapon of mass destruction long before they had nuclear weapons. Uh, but, but I think uh, more and more they realize that would be suicidal. So I'm, I'm just uh, – uh, it's good to see the U.S. and South Korea sort of back on something akin to the same sheet of music from what we were four years ago, and and so I think we can we can maneuver that better than we we could with the other. It's probably not a very good answer to your question, but Sarah, do you yeah. you had a hand a minute ago? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, Alan. Oh. That's what the North Koreans want, and I think we ought to we ought to approach that. I, you know, there's deep suspicions on all sides. You know, negotiate. If you followed negotiations with North Korea, even even you know, on the corner of your eye, you, it, it's sort of. This is a big football school. You know, it's sort of like playing football with a team that routinely moves the goalposts up, back, sideways. And then when you complain about it, they, they threaten to leave the stadium and blow it up on the way out. You know, it's, it's a, this, this is a frustrating negotiation, and, and the level of suspicion is such that even something seemingly simple, like let's have a peace treaty, is, is uh, fraught with suspicion. But I, I think we ought to move toward that. Yeah, I think it'll take some time, but I think that's, a, that's not a, an un, unrealistic goal. What's the barrier to it? Why, why don't we why don't we have a peace treaty? We got a new guy, Obama. Why doesn't he just say this sounds great? Well, you know, I, it's funny. I'm, I'm not I'm not quite sure. I suspect we see it as as uh, y you know it, it removes the uh, the uh, any any reason I suppose the, the next step would be to get American forces off the peninsula. Okay, fine. Uh, uh, but I don't think the threat goes away at that point, nor the long term challenge. Yeah, Alan. Yeah, that some folks see the North Korea as a Chinese excuse to stop exporting or to make the sensible and real sanctions. What is the U.S. and NATO do with that? I think I think that that would precipitate a, a move. Yeah.
No, I, I think, no, okay. They don't listen to me, though. I let me tell you. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know what our plan is, and I'm not even sure we've thought this through. Okay, I mean, I, what I'm suggesting is we need to think this through. I, I am assuming that that as as uh, as things get dicey in Pyongyang, that the army, large parts of it, start to go north toward the capital and become in, in you know kind of involved in this civil war. So it's not as if all of those forces are down there on the south anymore. But I, I do think that if China were to come across the northern border, boy, it'd be hard in Seoul to, to prevent a, a strong impulse to move north. And that's where you put up the defenses. Well, but you're going to have a, you know, you, you are going to have a, a, a I, I presume, and again, this, this scenario, as you say, can unfold in about a hundred different ways, but you are going to have uh, a, both, both an opportunity, but also a sizable humanitarian crisis up there. And I, I boy. Stranger things have happened in politics, right? I mean, so you think that we should just prevent that from happening? No, I, I, I don't actually. It's a little more complicated than that, but you, you know, and in the midst of a civil war, I don't know. Uh, you know, I assume at that point. You don't know the, that yeah. Will be the yeah. 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 You know, I, I, especially in the presence of this argument that, you know, that border uh, really is too far north, I, I well, it, it, it worries me that the soul will feel compelled to, to, move, to move north. And, and then the question is, you know, are they postured to move north? You know, who knows how far south the Chinese come? I've got hawkish Rand colleagues who feel that what China really wants to do is come down, get the nuclear sites as, as far south as it can because it's been complicit in that and it wants to get the evidence and move it north. Uh, but if they're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I like Chinese complicity in getting rid of the nuclear capability. The problem is they're complicit in getting it there too. But, but if they want to get rid of the evidence but take the nukes too, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I think Sewell watching, that, that brings them pretty far south. And I, I just think Sewell is going to be very uncomfortable there. All right, Sarah's back. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello again. Yeah, the question is, is he dead now or, you know, when do we yeah. find out about this for sure? I, it's, it's a bit of a problem. <laughs> So what's what's the replacement regime? Well, I, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> well, I, I don't know whether. Uh, look, I'm not. I, I can't even predict American politics uh, from day to day. But but I and, and nobody knows enough about North Korea. You just you just you know that there are three broad interest groups: family, party, army, uh, and an enormous amount. From what we can tell, sort of. I mean, this this makes Kremlinology look like an advanced science uh, by comparison, but. 
uh, an enormous amount of bureaucratic politics under that and coalition building across those three organizations. And you know, the the one one case is they they managed to put together a coalition government that that works. So you know, that's certainly a possibility. And and who knows? Maybe with with uh, Kim Jong Il gone, somebody gets the idea that we could begin to develop here, and, and you know, you, you get sort of the the best case South Korean Chinese scenario. Uh, but but certainly under those circumstances, and and uh, uh, with the army so well armed and so large, you can imagine more violent scenarios that, that kind of fall into uh, uh, a civil war of some sort. Uh, so you know, it's look, you're not going to be able to predict this. You just got to hedge against what you think are the the worst cases. And, and I think the more I think this through, the more I think we're just not postured to, to hedge against this at all. Uh, and the notion that, well, the South Koreans will do this really doesn't square with the size of their military or what it's postured to be. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, you ripple this through the force postures and, and you begin to think maybe we, we have to think through what we mean by military transformation, for example. But don't, don't, don't try to predict the future of North Korea. Just, you know, this is one where you really just have to hedge against what you think are plausible outcomes. Tim? Yeah. <coughs> South Korean. Yeah. Yeah. And no, no, to no. Okay, go ahead. Finish your question. Yeah. Yeah, there's deterrence. Plus, there's military plans to flow more forces in. Yeah. Well, of course, but, but I mean, you don't have to actually. By the time you started flowing more forces in, you know, presumably the 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 fuel situation on the north anyway is who knows what. Yeah. What, what it is. So you really not adding anything as far as what what the understanding would be by having the small numbers go to North Korea. I'm I'm just asking a question of strategy here. So what is what precisely? The problem I'm having is trying to understand what precisely the response team is going to put here and why it is that if the Korean forces are too small to move north, then why do you think we're going to be able to move – are, are our forces so large that we could afford to yeah. peel off a significant portion of this, this mission? Uh, I, that, that's yeah. part of what okay. I'm sort of having trouble with. Okay, no, I look, if, if you imagine, you know, a stabilization operation for a population as large as North Korea, getting smaller all the time, evidently, <laughs> but still fairly large, uh, you know, th that's going to have to be an international effort. You can't leave it to the South Koreans. I don't think they have the resources, the military resources to do it. You, the U.S. force is a U.N. command, by the way, so it would be the center of an internationalization of the problem. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You're saying that 500,000 armed soldiers probably yeah. have thousands. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think they need it. That's the part I'm having trouble with. Well, count up the numbers and uh, multiply by about twenty. Yeah. Okay. So this this is scary, right? No, I mean, what what is the population? Is that have, Isn't it know? like twenty million or something? So. Yeah. Yeah. And so okay. it's what ten per thousand. So that's or that's like about, that? no, it's about twenty per thousand. Numbers. So it's about it's about five hundred thousand. Uh, you know, by, by the sort of rule of thumb we use, it's about 20 per thousand population for a serious stabilization operation. Yeah, if people are shooting at us. No, uh, well, yeah, okay. Right. 10 per thousand is good enough for yeah. Northern Ireland. So. No, actually 20 per thousand was Northern Ireland and at its peak, but, but it. So you're talking 400,000? No, I'm talking about 500,000. And, you know, an army of 500,000 is not 500,000 operational forces. Well, yeah. So We'll put in something more more than we have there now. Look, if this happens tomorrow, we aren't flowing anything in, right? Right. Uh, uh, so we're talking down the road a ways. Uh,
You know, that's an interesting question. I, I, I mean, I look at the budget, I'm inclined to agree with you. Both presidential candidates committed themselves to increasing the size of the Marine Corps and the Army yeah, by a total of about 100,000. Well, okay, send them off to fight a war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, but they're larger, and, and I think it's... Yeah. Really? And, and there's so few of them there right now, right? We pulled the brigade out and sent it. Really? Okay. Well. And a much stronger case for Anthony Mullen for what happened to her that really matters in our view. Is it just a matter of, is that more important than the other parts of the changing American engagement? And it sounds like quite the opposite. Yeah, it might be. I mean, I've, maybe I'm not the best salesman, but I'd, I'd, I'd want to be involved in this for the long term. Yeah. <laughs> well, you certainly have a, the, the congruence of a lot of economic interests in that part of the world, that's for sure. I worry, you know, it's, I worry less about economic destabilization than proliferation myself, and, and the, a, a widening gap between Japan and the, and the mainland, and that scares me. That, that, that seems to me to be a long-term problem that we can help solve, and I'd like to do that. Oh, well. He was whispering in my ear, yeah. I'm getting kind of a no, subtext here. Yeah, well, so, I, I mean, I once wrote an article about uh, the effects of wars on neutral countries. So if we sit out the war and there's a war between two other large powers, what effect does it have on our economy, the economic effects of wars on neutrals? And, you know, there are a bunch of theories and ups and downs about different countries, but the general premise is that wars are consumption binges and people fighting wars are willing to pay a whole lot of money to import all kinds of stuff, right? So the price of all of our exports to Asia goes way up because they suddenly need, I don't know, soap that they're not making for themselves and we could sell them our soap. And so, um, you know, the, the amounts of money compared to the suffering of war are trivial, right? So there's no war profiteering. You don't really want to start wars to help your economy. But wars overseas, there's a a short-term cost when the economy has to adjust, but once the economy is adjusted to the to the new state of exports and prices, um, neutrals actually don't tend to be hurt by wars. But, it, um, but isn't that a cost that goes into the war? I mean, say, say we say we fight in Iraq, right? For example, when we went to Iraq to fight the Arabs, we paid that as a cost to fight the fight, didn't we? Some. So, it, I mean, this is not my talk, and I don't really want to go into Oh, you can answer that one, though. I'm. Um, <laughs> so, I... Uh, you know, in both World War One and World War Two, in our neutral periods, um, uh, the United States profited substantially from this, and um, we did some dumb things with respect to the shipping, um, especially in World War One, which allowed the Scandinavian shipping industry to profit tremendously. So Norway made a lot of money on the shipping um, because the United States, uh, essentially, because we were afraid of um, uh, American sailors dying, we banned certain American shipping participation, and then when we didn't, some people died. And Anyway, we, we were not willing to do it on an economic prospect to, to let rational actors in the shipping industry take the risk and say, you know, if you do this, you can make a lot of money. If you don't do it, it and, and if you happen to get killed, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, the United States is not defending you for doing this, right? We, we, didn't, we didn't take the position of um, ship at your own risk and make a lot of money, which is what the Norwegians did, and they did very well. But the... Um, um, uh, you know, 1914 to 1917, good times for the American economy. Uh, you know, 1939 to 1941, we, we did fine with our exports. Um, we got, we were, we were leaning into World War II more than World War I, so it's a little harder to disentangle the case. But, um, but you know, the, the economic story, I think, is um, that the transportation costs are pretty small, and the and the protection of sea lanes is is a pretty small cost compared to. Um, the other economic variables at work, like how much consumption is going on in the war zone. For sure. 
or Japan during World War yeah. I. Well, there, Japan there are lots during of the cases. Korean War. That's really That's what right. restarted Japan's one. economy in 1950, so. 51. Anyway, Phil, uh, we have a real historian. I, I, it has to be the most closed society, uh, I mean, that I know of. I, I don't follow the far reaches of Africa. Maybe there's something else, but I think it's, you know, it's it's funny. You, you, we, we think that Kim Jong-il had a minor stroke, and uh, we don't know. For, you know we, what, what I found, I, I mean, not a, I'm not a Korea specialist, I, but but I watched them debate, uh, you know, is that photograph two years old or is, is that taken last week? Is, did they airbrush out some people who died? Uh, you know, nobody knew whether to believe news of that or not. That's how close this is. Oh, okay. Oh. I don't think they know much. There, there's, uh, there, uh, I mean, they really have managed to stifle the information revolution. Radios are only tuned to certain channels. TVs, if you have one, only get certain, you know. Uh, there, is, there is a somewhat dangerous but steady flow of refugees across the border into China. And, and actually, I have a college classmate who, who's up there on the Chinese side of that border, and I'm going to talk to him next week, and I'll be curious to know uh, but, but, you know, those guys don't go back into North Korea to tell their folks. <laughs> you know, they, they get killed if they do that. So I, I think it's just about as, as closed in that sense as any society imaginable. It's, it's, it's a remarkable. Uh, Did North Korea make any effort to reach that group and get information into North Korea? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I would think that would be very much a function of the president. Yeah, the, the last Sunshine president policy. probably wouldn't. Yeah, the Sunshine probably one thing and, and Lee Man Young. Young Bach and others, so I, I don't I don't know what the policy is with them. Yeah. 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 Or, or Bob Gallucci, you know, you, there is an elite group that's very sophisticated here and very worldly. But you're talking about sort of the starving well, peasants right. in the field. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if there's like, if, you know, if, if people that aren't so strongly connected with the press, you know, as we agree to make something that kind of hurts their, you know, I don't know, their willingness to kind of bring that kind of thing to their own people. Yeah, and I and I can't answer that question. I'm not sure anybody can. I just don't know enough about it. Presumably, there's a good spin angle, right? That uh, North Korea is such a wonderful place that they want to come and perform here, right? <laughs> that you know, this is it was a know, marvelous they, concert. They, they aspire you didn't hear to the get tape, them to come, right? So, I mean, you can do wonderful things with propaganda in a very closed society. Uh, any other questions or comments? Right. Well, uh, thank you. This is a very engaging uh, uh, discussion. Excellent. We got a lot of back and forth. I, I, I with take the, audience, the message, though, your, your point that you know there's just not going to be any American support for a, a, a U.S. engagement is something I, I've got to wrestle with because I, uh, to me, it just it's uh, having been associated with Korea this long. It's something we should do. I mean, uh, you know, but but who am I? I'm not represent. Nobody would claim that I'm a representative of the American public opinion. I suppose. All right, Mark. Wants to come. Yeah, yeah, we know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not going to play that one on us again, but here you do. <laughs> Trick me once for. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a debate about how many, and, and uh, but uh, we know there's at least, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, right now we we. No, we're not. We're we're really uh, well. As, as uh, a book written by my organization uh, said, we're really stretched thin right now. We're not uh, really capable of deploying too many other places. All right. Well, on that, what a pleasure. Inspiring, positive Thanks. note. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Tom, for coming. Thank you all for coming and hearing the talk.